Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today. I appreciate your time and dedication to learn something new. My name is Ruth Del Pino. I'm a prevention educator for the Mercer Council on Alcoholism and Drug Addiction. And today we are going to be talking about peer pressure in the summer months, which I don't know if a lot of people are really concerned about this, but this is something that we should always um, keep in the back of our minds throughout this summer season. Um, but first thing is, I always start with this just so we know that we have a base of what we're looking at and then we go forward from there. Just so you know, my name is Rita Pina. Hello. I'm a prevention educator and I'm in the Mercer County Grant Program Coordinator. I have a Bachelor of Arts in Global Studies, Political Science and American Studies. I'm certified in teaching English as a foreign language, life skills training and leadership. So a lot of these, uh, a lot of these parts, a lot of this information that we have here um, informs me on how I sort of put these presentations together as we're sort of looking at my background and the lens that I'm looking through. Um, so first of all, why this presentation? I always do this part just in case anybody gets scared from some of the statistics. There are things in here that aren't necessarily easy to digest. These are things that can be harder for us to listen to, but they're good, important things for us to know in the name of prevention and in the name of harm reduction. First thing, this is not to scare you. This is to inform you. This is also not a parenting class. You are the best parent for your child. You know them the best. You've probably known them longer than they've known themselves. Um, but I also wanna say that this is a presentation for anyone working with youth. So if you have any questions that are uh, pertaining to youth, any questions that are pertaining to children that you may work with, this is a great place to be. Also, my perspective is shaped by my approach and my learning experiences. So anything I gather as a prevention educator, I sort of consolidate those resources, put them into a presentation, and then go from there. Um, this is evidence-informed and some evidence-based. And what I mean by that is evidence-informed in terms of me doing my presentation, coming up with a lot of different studies, a lot of different empirical resources, putting them into the presentation, and then informing the presentation through those numbers, but also evidence-based in that a lot of these programs and a lot of the things that I'm talking about are based in the evidence-based programs that we do at the Mercer Council, such as Life Skills, Too Good for Drugs, footprints um, and parents who host. So those are some of the programs that inform um, the way that I present these presentations. Um, if you have any questions about those programs or anything else, uh, please put them in the chat or reach out to us at the Versa Council. <clears throat> so first thing I want to talk about is when we're talking about peer pressure, and I sort of want to define it as we move forward, because I think that that's a really important part that we are looking at and that we're sort of looking to address um, Everyone is doing it means that there is a level of peer pressure that happens around anybody, right? But when we're sort of talking about it, there are many different types of peer pressure. And I did touch upon this actually in my very first um, video that I'd ever done for this, uh, for this program. And I'm using the same video for the specific reason because there are different types, but when we're looking at it, there are two different types and that doesn't mean they're harder than the other, but it does mean one is definitely more, um, more gentle in its approach. So there's soft power and then there's hard power. And what we sort of mean by this is that soft power is sort of the implicit um, peer pressure and hard power is the sort of, uh, if you don't do this, then X, Y, Z. So there's a lot of consequence there, but I do want to um, do this. Um, video before we sort of move forward. And um, there'll be some parts in here that I think could be really interesting. All right, so let's take a look at uh, the three types of power as outlined by Joseph Nye. Um, so we have hard power, which is really characterized by um, really hard nosed things that countries can do to disrupt other countries. And that is maybe military intervention or the threat of it. Or you could have economic sanctions where countries refuse to trade with each other, such as the case with uh, the United States and Iran. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, we have soft power. And that really is sort of the cultural influence that countries have over other cult, uh, countries, such as television and ads and products that are coming from the United States and influencing the Eastern side of things. Um, also, some outreach, maybe having different sporting exchanges, those kinds of things between countries. Uh, in the middle is sort of a combination of both, and it's something that Nye refers to as smart power. And that's using a combination of hard power, maybe economic sanctions or the threat of them, or maybe even aid with diplomacy, cultural ties, in, in, in a very smart way so that you can predict the outcome of diplomatic negotiations between countries. 
Okay, so um, obviously this is not a diplomacy class, but this is something that I thought was really interesting and it was something that sort of informed the way that I worked through uh, this presentation. So um, while we are moving through uh, something that is soft power and hard power, what we're looking at here is that peer pressure is sort of the same way in that when we are looking at diplomacy, diplomacy is just peer pressure. It's something that a lot of people use to influence the way they interact with one another. And that one is a sort of a soft power, as they said before, is an implication, it's culture, it's gentle, it's a suggestion. And then you have hard power, which is much more, um, much harder and much more defined in the way that they interact with one another. So there can be economic sanctions, there could be military power and things like that. But when we were sort of looking at it this way, then when we understand the way that people interact with one another, then those actions really do shape the way that the perception is. So what I mean by that is there are two different ways that we can look at this. And there are a lot of different ways that children tend to look at peer pressure, but there's a perception of risk, which is essentially something where children say, oh, everyone is doing it, therefore, um, everyone, uh, therefore I want to fit in and use it. Um, so there's a perception that everyone is doing it. There's a perception that um, if they don't do this and they won't be able to fit in versus the empirical side, the evidence-based side where the majority of children aren't engaging in substance use. They aren't engaging in harmful and risky behaviors, but there are two different ways to look at this. And depending on what kind of peer pressure you interact with, it can be very, um, hard to know the difference. And what I mean by this also is that soft and hard power and the ability to be implicit and overt sort of bleed into each other. They're not one uh, or the others, they're sort of defined by each other because there can be a lot of situations where it is implicit peer pressure, where it is soft peer pressure, sort of a suggestion versus something that is much harder and stronger, where someone might say, um, if you don't do this, I'm not going to be your friend. There's a very definitive way that people can interact with that. But if there's a perception of of someone who has led that life and you say, well, if my older sister or older brother does it, then maybe I can do it too. So there's a lot of different ways uh, that we can look at this. And my apologies for the capital R, but negative and positive peer pressure, it can also be the same way. So they can exist in both, meaning that when you have negative peer pressure, negative peer pressure pushes people to do something that may be harm, harmful to themselves or risky to their, to their body or to their mind, but that doesn't mean that um, positive peer pressure can exist in either as well. Positive peer pressure, meaning it could be good for that person, but there is still a sense of uh, whether or not it can be implicit or overt. So th those negative and positive peer pressure in their own right, negative can be much more harmful, but that doesn't mean that both can exist in both soft and hard power or implicit and overt peer pressure. So we're going to be moving on. All right, so um, I had to address this for a couple of reasons. And what I mean by this is that I don't want to start this summer season without us recognizing that this last year has been hard, um, that this last year has been difficult for a lot of students and a lot of children moving through um, their day to day lives. And how have things changed? One, safety concerns have changed. Um, that means that safety in its own right is different and it looks different these days. And there are more people that are vaccinated, which can equal more freedom to go out and do things. Um, if there is a level of mental security there, a level of health security there. Um, but that also means that they are still going to be cautious, that people are still going to be moving through their environments a little differently. Um, and also the fact is that loss and death were definitely a part of 2020 as well as 2021. And I'm going to just let you know that I'm going to be talking about death right now. Um, so I will actually let you know in case you don't want to listen to this, I can put a time card um, if you're looking at this, the YouTube description to move forward to the next slide. But um, as we're talking about this, I did sort of want people to know that the CDC uh, reported that the year 2020 was the deadliest year for drug overdoses. About 81,000 drug overdose deaths occurred in the United States in the 12 months of, tw of uh, 2020 from May 2020 to May 2021. 
Um, and this is uh, concerning for a lot of different reasons, but it's not surprising. And this is something for us to recognize that it's not surprising. It is something that is sort of an expectation, but it is also something to address so that we know that this is something that's happening and then we can move forward uh, by going from there. Also, a lot of the stress is sort of um, something that happens a lot while uh, people are going through, had been going through this year because of the variations of different reasons. And I will be touching more upon this um, in, in another slide. So this is not something I'm done with, but I did want to preface saying that things have changed and they are interacting with the way that children um, and the way that people are sort of moving through their day to day life. All right. So coping skills, um, I know that we're sort of taking a shift, uh, a shift on this, but I think that in order for us to understand the way that children are going to be interacting with their environment this summer, we need to know what coping skills are, we need to know what they look like. So what are they? Um, what are they is that coping skills are anything that help us respond to something that is stressful or respond to something that um, can be harmful to us or that uh, make our lives harder. Coping skills are essentially sort of the crutch or the safe space that we have in order for us to get through the day to day. Um, and once again, coping skills are a response to something, meaning that coping skills can definitely happen, but they are a response to something that is happening to that person. So that doesn't mean that it is not something that, you know, can come out of thin air or can, that can be, um, that can Oh, my apologies. I'm just looking at the chat right now to make sure everything's okay. So um, coping skills can be a lot of different things. Um, and some examples of it can be writing, reading, myself and my nieces who are 10 and 13, we bake together. That's our coping skill. Um, that's something that we do in case we're all stressed out in the house. Um, we also do a lot of artwork. Uh, we love to paint together. Um, that's something that we like to do as well. And it is something that um, is nice to create. It's nice to sort of cope with some of that stress. But when we're sort of looking at um, different ways of coping skills and how drinking and substance misuse and abuse can happen is the maladaptation of it. So Coping skills in their own right are not negative or positive. They're something that we do on our own. So if we are saying that, you know, I just want to escape this reality, I just want to be away, I just want to do something that makes me feel different or numb or, you know, not so angry or not so sad. Sometimes the maladaptation can be substance use or uh, abuse. And this is where more of the self-destructive behaviors are found. So it may not necessarily be substance misuse, but it could definitely be something that causes bodily harm. It could be something that is not very good for mental health. It could be risky behaviors such as having unprotected sex or having, um, oh, we have two people in the waiting room. Sorry, I'm just making sure that everything's okay. All right. so. Um, uh, and then we're going from there. But when we are sort of talking about maladaptation as well, I want us to understand that we are going to be talking about ACEs. And I know I talk about ACEs in every presentation I do, but this is something so important and for us to recognize as we're moving forward. And ACEs essentially stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. And I have a great presentation on it about what to do, uh, how to talk to your children and what to do, uh, how to talk to your children before it matters. Uh, I may have messed up the title there, but I will uh, link that uh, video in the description below if you are looking at this uh, at the YouTube, uh, on the YouTube uh, platform. So um, ACEs essentially is something that happens when you're younger and affects you later on in your formative years. So it could be a traumatic event. It could be several, it could be, um, you know, generational poverty. It could be racism. It could be systemic uh, sexism. There could be a lot of different areas for us to sort of look at how ACEs affects children. But essentially in the long run is that through ACEs and through trauma and adverse childhood experiences, for us to understand that people when they grow older do use coping skills that can be maladaptive if they aren't addressed in their formative years. Um, and this is also cause for concern for a lot of different reasons, but for also for us to understand that COVID and 2020 were something that happened during youth's formative years. And coping skills could have changed their, malad their maladaptation due to the fact that their social nets and their um, security nets may have been changed and may have been altered. So this is something for us to keep in mind as we're moving forward. Once again, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat as we move around. 
All right. So um, what's new for this season? Um, I think that in general, uh, 2021 kind of threw us for a curveball, especially in the prevention education world. Um, there were a lot of different reasons for this, but it's specifically because the new cannabis policy actually came into being. And this was something that um, I and a lot of my colleagues were sort of um, wrapping our minds around to sort of understand how we could move forward in prevention education so that we could still feel like we were doing something good for the community. And uh, there will be a presentation on this later on in this month. I believe it'll be the last week in July. I'll be doing it with Melissa Arnold, on, uh, who I, I believe is here right now. Um, but yes, we will be talking about the cannabis policy together and we sort of break it down. And I have gone through all of the cannabis policy for us to sort of look through. It is about 200 pages. So I think that I deserve a medal personally, but that's neither here nor there. Um, and also when we are sort of looking through this cannabis policy, there are a lot of different ways that we can address it, but it will affect the way that people interact with law enforcement, the way that they interact with their peers, and their communities. So I implore you to look at some of the new cannabis policy and at least look at the highlights for uh, your, you and your uh, significant people in your life to understand how to interact with it. So there are a lot of different ways to do that. Alcohol obviously is something that has been going on. It's not something that has necessarily changed. Um, and it is something that uh, while we are sort of looking through this, um, this system that, and the system of being in the summer, the system of people interact with their environments, alcohol is still something that is present, regardless of what that looks like, regardless of how old you are, whether it's in a family setting or with friends or whatnot. So this is still something to keep in mind as we're moving forward. I also look at a lot of different ways that social media sort of interacts with the way that children are um, engaging in their upcoming events. So for us to sort of understand, there is a hashtag for 420. And if anybody doesn't know, 420 essentially is the hashtag for cannabis or marijuana. And I just wanted to look at this really quickly so that we can understand that there are a lot of videos based on 420. Um, and if we're sort of looking at the views here, it's 5.7 billion views, meaning that there are 5.7 billion views on marijuana, cannabis, and things of that like. And obviously there are doctors in between, there are people that are actually responding to some of the questions people have about cannabis policy, but most of it is people just smoking or um, engaging in cannabis use um, and putting it on social media. So that is something for us to sort of look at and may be concerned by because of the way that uh, we, they are, they socialize youth, right? And it can be found in places everywhere. It's not something that's age restricted. And for us to also understand, um, I did look at some TikTok stats because TikTok is like the app for Generation Z as we're sort of looking through this. And what it had found is that 62%, over half of TikTok uh, users in the United States are aged 10 to 29. Obviously, uh, it would be nicer if they sort of broke that down a little bit more. But that is for us to understand that a good chunk of people who are using TikTok are people that are underage and shouldn't be engaging in substance use in the first place. Now, as we're sort of sifting through what can be, uh, what else is new for this season, actually the season itself is new. Um, and what I sort of wanted to address is that uh, this summer will be one of the hottest summers that we have had in the United States, or especially in New Jersey in a very long time. And while we're sort of looking at these record-breaking numbers, understand that climate change has definitely been something that is quite of a concern, but that's not necessarily the platform I'm taking here. What I'm saying is that when we are looking at the temperature and the way the environment physically changes, the way teenagers and the way youth interact and socialize changes too, meaning that they will be indoors more, meaning that maybe they'll be outside in shaded areas, they'll group together more, they'll try to find cooling areas. Um, they may not be outside, but while they're inside, that's where a lot of the substances are. That's where a lot of the alcohol can be hidden in cupboards. So for us to understand that temperature does change the way people socialize, and we should just keep that in mind moving forward. Once again, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat. Now, um, partying during the summer season, and I don't know if anyone is sort of concerned about partying during this time, but partying in general and having parties in the summer is sort of a thing that happens, right? We have 4th of July, we have um, 
we have a lot of different ways for us to interact with our environments and we have birthdays, we have pool parties, we have barbecues, you know, there are so many different ways that it happens. So why could it look different than during the school year? One is there are a lot of activities that happen during this time, um, but there were also a lot of activities during the school year. So a lot of children were very engaged in sort of getting their activities together and, you know, looking through um, after school activities, things like that. They also had homework. There was a lot of homework during that time. People just had to engage in schooling more. And also you're around family in a more structured way, meaning you woke up, you went to school, you had, uh, you know, homework to do after school activities, dinner, bed, all over again, right? So with, you're around family in a more structured way during the school year, but during the summer, there's a lot more lackadaisical approaches to way that the time and uh, linear linearness looks, right? So when we're sort of looking through that, we also need to understand that their schedules will literally just look different. So that does give them room to go to more social events and to party in different ways. Now, um, I found this interesting because I really wanted to know whether or not summer was actually the time that um, youth engaged in substance use. And while we're looking at this, I, there is actually a wonderful resource, SAMHSA.gov, that actually looks at month by month on how substance use works. And this was in 2012, so this is a little older, but the numbers I think will still sort of be relatively the same. And what they had found is, and I'm going to read some of these numbers out here, is that first time use of most substances peaks during the summer months of June and July. On an average day in June, July, or December, more than 11,000 youths used alcohol for the first time. In other months, the daily average ranged from 5,000 to 8,000 new users per day. On an average day in June, July, more than 5,000 youths smoke cigarettes for the first time. In other months, the daily average ranged from about 3,000 to 4,000 new users per day. And now we're going to talk about marijuana. On average, in June or July, more than 4,800 youths used marijuana for the first time, whereas the daily average ranged from 3,000 to 4,000 in other months. So what we're looking at here is that the initiation for these drugs and the initiation for people to say yes to this stuff from their peers and from other, other sources is higher in the summer months, just due to the velocity of how many people they interact with, right? So this is something that um, I think can be a cause for concern, but it is also something that should just be monitored throughout the time that youth are just interacting with their day to day. So I also want to think that when we're talking about how did we get here, um, peer pressure will definitely play a role in how um, teenagers will sort of move through their day to day, but understand that it has been a tumultuous year and that there are life events that are happening, right? So they had proms, they started new grades, they had birthdays, there was definitely a pandemic and there were mental health concerns on the rise while they, we were moving through uh, this sort of system here. But there can be a lot of different ways that we people are coping and that children are coping and they could sort of be using all of of this residual uh, stress and anxiety throughout the year to just get through the academic year, right? But the summer can be the time for them to kick back, for them to relax, and possibly for them to mitigate a lot of their mental health concerns that may have popped up throughout the year. And maybe they may also not have addressed them. So um, I just wanted to play a video just for us to understand that the uh, mental toll on teenagers and especially youth was definitely damning. The COVID crisis has taken a psychological toll on all of us, but teens are especially hard hit. Instead of going to class and hanging out with friends, teenagers have been banished to a life of screens, solitude and uncertainty. School closures and social distancing have cut them off from their support networks. The risk of developing anxiety and depression is higher. Psychologists say the needs of teens are often overseen when it comes to COVID risk. Oh, my apologies, just for a second. I did want to warn that there will be some numbers and mentions of suicidal ideation. So um, in case anybody is watching this from the YouTube description, I will give you a timestamp so that you can move ahead so you don't have to watch this. I'm Ben Fazul and thanks for joining us. The struggle continues. COVID hasn't gone away. It's one wave after the next, and lockdowns become part of life for many of us. But that doesn't make it any easier. Teen mental health services are overwhelmed in countries like Belgium. DW's Rose Burchard reports. Open the door. 
for another young person who needs help. Lisa Terrell is an associate professor in psychology at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. One year into this pandemic, a year Okay, um, my apologies, uh, I let that play for too long. But um, yes, yeah, so when we are sort of looking at this, and I know that there have definitely been a lot of spaces for people to talk about mental health during uh, the COVID crisis, but when we are sort of looking at this, it's not as if I'm saying this is how it is for teens right now. I'm saying that in 2021, we've sort of shifted towards a post-COVID uh, reality, right? So there's definitely presence um, in other places, but for teenagers, it sort of feels like they just want things to be over with, that they are sort of praying that post-COVID happens, right? So if they sort of shift towards that mentality, understand also that there will definitely be remnants of the anxiety, of the concern, of the uh, lack of social socialization that they had that will play into the way that they cope and the way that they interact with one another, which can play its part into peer pressure as well. So um, I just sort of wanted to say that this is a baseline for us to understand. And yes, this is, this is a really hard reality for a lot of different people to come to terms with, but that doesn't mean that there are things that we can't do in order to mitigate those responses and in order for in order for uh, children to not have good coping skills. So as long as we give them good coping skills and we give them the reality to do that, then we can sort of move forward from there. Um, uh, there's something in the chat. I, I can't see the chat right now, but uh, if anyone can unmute themselves and talk about it, that would be great. Um, so I'll be moving forward from there. I yes. was I was just saying a study dropped yesterday that said that the needs of young children's mental health issues are the highest ever due to COVID. And what's kind of unique with that is that people have been recognizing that adolescents need help, but children is kind of a, a surprise, so to speak. And so there are very, there are even fewer resources for children and it's, it's just changed. So COVID reactions have changed just the way that we see mental health care in general and who is affected and who's not. So as I said, that just came out yesterday. I happened to see the headline. Thank you for that, Melissa. I really do appreciate that. And when we're sort of looking at this, that is something to be of concern, right? Especially when you're saying, oh, you know, I work with seven-year-olds. Maybe they don't necessarily have the same concerns as a youth. Of course not. That doesn't mean that a seven-year-old and a 15 year old don't necessarily, that may, they may not have the same type of trauma responses, but they still have trauma responses and both are able to, they should have a lot of those mitigating factors for them to not have um, you know, uh, risky coping skills later on, right? So this is something to keep in mind. This is something of concern. And yes, there are teenagers everywhere that are going through a lot of things, but also understand that, you know, um, everyone had been affected and all age groups definitely need help with this process. All right, so here we go. All right, so um, I just wanted to touch upon really quickly because uh, a lot of youth will be getting summer jobs this year. And um, when we're sort of looking at it, there may be areas that summer jobs actually give teens um, peer pressure. And just for us to look at that, this is not something to be scared of. This is not something to let people know, oh, you know, don't let them have a job. It's more like, just understand that this may happen and then we're gonna move on from there, right? So um, there are a lot of different ways for us to do this, but I have this article here that actually talked about a, uh, a teenage uh, girl who was 16, who uh, I believe this is Ohio. And um, the reason that her she had experienced peer pressure at her job, and she said it was due to the older coworkers having access to drugs and alcohol. And she had actually drank while she was on her summer job. I believe she was a lifeguard, if I'm not mistaken. So, um, oh no, sorry, it was a pizza place. My apologies, I just read here as a pizza place. So while we are sort of looking through that, understand that jobs can be a lot of good. They are very good for children to have. One, it's constructive. Two, it teaches them responsibility, but also understand with that responsibility comes extra money. And with that extra money, understand that there will be places for them to want to spend it and that's great you know they can spend it on trips to the beach with their friends they can spend it on a lot of different areas for them to have social lives with their uh with their uh counterparts whoever that may look like so when we're sort of looking at that understand that extra money will just be the factor in how they socialize right so um they may also have money for paying people to buy alcohol they also may have money for buying a substances of somebody else. So 
um, having that conversation may be a really good place to start when they start their summer jobs and they're moving through their summer jobs so that you can say, hey, I understand that you may be saving up for something. I understand that maybe you just want to spend all your money, but just know that how you spend your money is just as important as how you're getting the money in the first place. Now also understand too that summer camps can be a place where drugs definitely are present, especially when children have to take it due to uh, medical concerns. Um, so also know that there have been instances where people, you know, raid the drug cabinets of our summer job and sort of uh, do things with it that they're not supposed to and abuse uh, the prescriptions that may be available to the children or are supposed to be for the children. So just keeping that in mind and understanding that summer camps are definitely another way of socialization. They are definitely another way for children to have normalcy for them to socialize um, uh, very normally together, but um, it can still be something that uh, is a risk factor if, um, if things can go wrong. So there's that as well. Um, so I also want to talk about social media trends because where I would be remiss if I didn't talk about social media trends, but we're sort of talking about Generation Z, right? So um, there are a lot of different ways that uh, this sort of uh, has looked through. And this was for 2017, so this is a little bit older, but a lot of these trends that this, uh, this, it's actually a blog that looks at the way that social media interacts with the, um, a lot of its users. And for us to know that it's not that much different, right? So there were 10 uh, different suggestions, I believe it was nine or 10 different suggestions that they had said um, that will be something that are up and coming and something that will keep going uh, through social media. One, brands will continue to take a less is more uh, posting approach, meaning very minimalistic marketing. Um, content value will be production quality. So um, when you're sort of looking at the value versus the production uh, children especially tend to really look at the value versus oh, saying, oh, this looks very pretty. Conversational marketing will change its tone. Um, consumers will crave snackable content. Snackable content meaning something that's shorter, something that is uh, much more easily digestible. So TikTok uh, is a great place for that because you have very short bits of information that you can consume very quickly and in a rapid amount of time. Um, also, videos will take center stage, much as YouTube and TikTok have done. More brands will go live, meaning Instagram uh, has gone live, YouTube has gone live, um, TikTok has gone live. There are a lot of, oh, Facebook has gone live as well. So the live parts of it actually give a lot of children access to their uh, favorite users and their favorite TikTok stars, their favorite YouTube stars and things like that. So I actually talk about this a lot with Amy Argerio uh, when we're talking about marketing. Um, so I can also link that uh, in the description below. Um, also, social media platforms could double as shopping channels, meaning that when you're sort of advertising to people saying, hey, you know, use this, here's a link for this. And then you can actually stay on the app while you're shopping through the app. Um, users will embrace gaming and VR. That has something that's been happening. And authenticity will be vital. And what we mean by that is authenticity, what um, a lot of Generation Z tend to really like the, the concept of authenticity, being real, being, uh, you know, uh, someone who sort of shows their flaws, so to speak. And a lot of the time you see TikTok stars doing the same things. And you see a lot of people who are trying to appear very authentic in the way that they uh, interact with one another. So this can also play a part in uh, peer pressure as well, because you want to be authentic, but you also want to fit in. So there are two different ways for us to look at this, right? Um, and also for us to understand that while we are looking at social media trends and marketing and things like that, understand also that TikTok has a lot of different um, a lot of different areas for advertising to happen. And that also means that that advertising happens with alcohol brands and with certain brands having an actual account on the app where children can access it. So there are a lot of different um, brands that have, you know, uh, alcohol and TikTok users while we're looking through this. Spirited LA is definitely one of them. Um, Tim the Tank Official. Uh, a lot of different areas for alcohol brands to have their social media accounts. So that is something for us to keep in mind as well as children are being socialized to sort of look through their coping skills and what they're going to be turning to to cope uh, through this tumultuous year. Okay, so how can we help? Um, I think that for us to understand, one, uh, give children interesting and fun things to do. That can be a great way to do that as well. Um, 
it has been a while, but pay attention to how this year has changed them. There are a lot of different ways that children will interact with you and for us to understand that we are definitely their safe spaces, that we are the people they go to when they are scared, upset, concerned. Um, being that person can be really important for us to do. Life events at school and with friends may have changed. Treat them with the same energy, if not more than every other year. So if they had a prom, you know, um, that could have been really exciting for them to interact with because, you know, that was the first time that they could have had it. And that was the first time that they could have had it under a pandemic. So understand that there will be firsts that they've had that have definitely changed the way that they interact with them. Know where they are. Uh, that could be another one. Know where they are physically being. Um, be involved in their lives. Uh, ask them questions. Know their friends. Know their friends' parents. Lead by example, meaning that if you are coping in a maladaptive way, children will see that and you, uh, they will also cope in a maladaptive way just because that's the thing that they know. Um, and also help yourself too and understand that when we are looking through the way that children are socialized and the way that we are interacting with them, we are also giving them examples on how to lead their lives. So if we show that we're drinking in order to cope, if we show that we're doing something that is not good for us, um, then that's that's not something that they should be uh, witnessing. So help yourself too, and understand that you know if you help yourself, then you can be that safe space for children to interact with. Um, I also end all my presentations with a quote, just because I feel one, it's necessary because why not? But two. Um, I think that it sort of consolidates a lot of what uh, the presentation is about, but how we sort of interact with it, right? So taking the time to truly listen to someone can communicate our love and respect even more than the spoken word. And what I mean by this is that when we have children that are looking uh, and interacting with peer pressure and the ramifications of this year, um, they may want to give in to the areas of peer pressure that they feel, right? They may give in to the areas of saying, you know, it's just one time or it's just one hit or it's just one shot. There are a lot of different areas for us to say, all right, they may be feeling this way. And there are so many steps before them making that decision that we can mitigate. There are so many steps before that that we can look and say, hey, I am listening, sit down with me, let's talk about it. So um, I think that when we have our actions um, be so intentional and our words be so kind to children and youth as they're interacting with their day to day and they're sort of constantly not trying to give into peer pressure and constantly trying to navigate how the world works, that we can be that person who also gives them a listening ear and a safe space to sit and also just a soft landing. Um, so thank you for being here. Thank you for your time. Thank you for all of your you know, input and things like that. Next week, I will actually be talking about how to interact with the hard of hearing community and the substance use disorders that exist there. Um, so yeah, thank you for your time. See you next week.